Thank you for watching us on YouTube. But did you know that if you're on the go, you can get the full show as a podcast now? You can get our morning breakdown of the most important topics facing our country, news not being covered by the mainstream media, interviews with change-making progressives, and info on what you can actually do about all this. Search for The Damage Report on your favorite podcast app and subscribe so you know when new episodes are ready to go. So we talk about political polarization quite often on this program, but it is possible that we've been getting some of the fundamentals wrong. We're gonna be joined now by author and political scientist Mark Hetherington, who's gonna help break it down for us, perhaps correct some of our misconceptions. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, it's good to be here. Uh, well, we're glad to have you. You're the author of this book, uh, Prius or Pickup, How the Answers to Four Simple Questions Explain America's Great Divide. Uh, I wanna understand that divide a little bit uh, better. Um, yep. So uh, in your book, you talk about, like we like to think of ourselves as complex individuals who make choices without reference to other things, but you've identified some pretty core ways that we sort of sort ourselves into competing worldviews. Can you explain that? Sure. You know, the thing that's so interesting about politics today is that it's so different from how it used to be. So when you think about pretty much everything that we know as scholars, it's premised on the idea that people don't really care about politics very much. And we look around these days and we think to ourselves, boy, um, it seems like we care almost too much about politics. The polarization is so overwhelming. And the reason is because of the things that we're divided about. Um, the things that we're divided about because their race and because their immigration and gender equality and things along those lines. Um, those things are those ideas are driven by our worldviews. You know how dangerous we think the world is, how open to new ideas we are, and that's a lot different from how it used to be when the dividing line used to be how much government we ought to have. Um, should government do more programs or fewer? So as a result. We have this politics that's just much more visceral, much deeper down inside of us. And in fact, you know, the evidence is that we're making decisions about politics probably before conscious thought even begins. So uh, you, you talk about obviously in this, you've got you know the four simple questions and all that. Can you describe a few of these particular things that are helping to differentiate groups in America? Well, you know, the key thing that we have going here is the answers to questions of all things um, about desirable qualities in children that we think um, kids ought to have. Um, whether kids uh, ought to be independent or curious versus have respect for their elders or have good manners. Mm -hmm. Whether we think kids ought to be self-reliant and considerate or whether it would be better if they were obedient or well-behaved. It's really amazing how those questions reveal their worldviews. Um, and the interesting thing about it is those four questions, they didn't tell us anything about people's party identification in the 1990s or the 1980s or so forth. But these days, um, if a person wants independent kids who are curious, self-reliant and considerate, they're almost wholly Democrats. And if mm -hmm. um, people want pe uh, kids who are respecting of their elders, have good manners, uh, are obedient and uh, uh, well behaved. They're almost all Republicans in this day and age. And just think about how fundamental that is to our lives. Um, you know, do we want um, uh, things that are organized in this sort of traditional hierarchical way, or do we want people to be able to pursue what they think is best? Um, and that, of course, touches on all sorts of parts of our lives, not just politics. And that's another part of this book that's so important and why we have the title Prius or Pickup. Mm -hmm. It turns out the same types of people who are interested in driving new sort of uh, different cars or drink, you know, sort of different coffee or um, things along those lines, those decisions map, match up with politics eerily well in this day and age. So I wanna try to understand a little bit about about the timeline in an individual's life of how this works out. So back, um, so back before I was in media, I was actually a political science graduate student. I worked with uh, the World Values Survey, which gets at a little bit of what you're talking about, about yeah. um, you know how children should be raised, things like that. And it's been done for decades. I mean, you know, I'm just saying it for the, the audience. Um, in many different countries, to try to map out generational shifts in these competing values. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm curious about is, are people? Are, are parents like sort of thinking about how to raise their children based on the things they've thought about in terms of society and politics? Or are people being raised with these values and that is causing them to then think about political parties, political positions, things like that in that way? Like, where do you think the causality is here? Or is it just a reciprocal process? Well, the way that we look at it, and I think this is right, is that 
there's no reason to think that these uh, worldviews necessarily, whether what we call fixed or fluid uh, on the opposite ends of this divide, that those things have actually changed very much. What's changed actually is politics and the types of things that our leaders make salient to us, make important to us in terms of our decision making process. Um, back in a day when, you know, say we were wondering about should we spend more on highways? Should we spend more on healthcare education? Our worldviews wouldn't have anything to do with our preferences about those types of things. But as politics evolved to being about race and sexual orientation and gender and how to keep us safe from terrorism, the things that those worldviews capture, you know, how dangerous the world is. Should we batten down the hatches against uh, those types of threats, or is it safe to explore the world and things along those lines? That's what those worldview questions capture. So it's not necessarily that our parenting ideas have changed. It's that the worldviews that those capture now map eerily well onto politics. And do you believe that that's just a natural evolution in American politics? Or do you think that politicians are becoming more savvy and are consciously using, if not directly your type of research, the general idea underlying it? I don't think that there's any doubt about the fact that politicians are tapping into this uh, dividing line. You know where this started really was the 1960s. Um, so this is you know where this whole um, process uh, begins. Uh, why did all of a sudden Republicans start to talk about race and gender equality and things along those lines, crime and punishment? Well, it's because they always lost elections. And so politicians decided, look, we have to change the way that people um, identify with the parties. We have to change the basis for which they do that. And that worked stunningly well for Republicans for quite a while. And now think about this present point in time. You know, Donald Trump's approach to politics taps into the preferences of fixed worldview people perfectly. And it's interesting, you know, we did a interview with somebody with a journalist in Canada who was connected to the uh, Trump campaign in some way, one of the, the operatives there. And he said, you know, what the Trump people were trying to identify in their supporters was people who had Old Testament values about punishment and crime. Mm -hmm. You know, this is exactly the kind of thing that um, we're talking about in in this book. Um, uh, those with fixed worldviews are concerned about people who are different from them, people who uh, stand out from the uh, the norm. Uh, you know, certainly concerns about criminals and terrorists and immigrants and all these you know outsider types of people. This is exactly who Donald Trump is appealing to. And of course, Democrats are taking the reverse position on these things. And of course, the reasons that they are is, you know, they know who their supporters are. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the decisions politicians are making, you know, is deepening and widening, making this divide even worse. So you've described this process. If if we assume that this is not necessarily a good thing or a sustainable thing for our, either our culture or our politics, um, based on what you've learned through your research, what can we as individuals or members of the media or politicians actually do about it? It's a really tough set of circumstances. I wish there was a, a, you know, just a, a perfect solution to this, but there honestly isn't. But what we, so you think about how we ended up with this particular divide where our worldviews, you know, these sort of gut level reactions to politics have come to divide us. The reason is because of the things that our political leaders made important to us, you know, these hot button culture issues, you know, God, guns, uh, things along those lines. The only way that's going to change is if the types of things that leaders make important to us change. Um, they have to have incentives to do that, however. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't have incentives to do it, they're not going to do it because why do politicians choose the issues um, that they choose to win elections? Yeah. And right yeah. now it is so 50-50, anybody taking a risk one way or the other um, risks you know, losing big. And unless one side or the other um, uh, falls into a, a real deficit, I think we're going to see more of the same and it's going to continue to be as disquieting as the Kavanaugh hearings and everything else have been lately. Okay, well, we're ending on a bit of a somber note, but at least we have some yeah. information uh, that we can possibly iterate on. Um, so uh, Mark Hetherington, thank you for joining us on the show, author of uh, Prius or Pickup, available, very interesting book. I recommend everyone watching this that they uh, take a look at it. Thank you for thank joining you so us. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. 
If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.